Thank you for the introduction, Darren. Um, as Darren mentioned, I serve on the Student Advisory Council for the Institute of Politics as one of the event committee co-chairs. The Institute of Politics has opened its doors at 5707 South Woodlawn to students from all departments, graduate and undergraduate, to participate in political discourse and activities on topics from the role of women in politics to gun control to the focus of this quarter's events, the 2012 presidential election. This evening, I have the pleasure to introduce the former Speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich, who will be interviewed by the founding director of the Institute of Politics, David Axelrod. Speaker Gingrich, who the Washington Times called an indispensable leader, is widely considered one of the most influential Republican thought leaders of our time. After receiving his bachelor's degree from Emory University, he went on to pursue doctoral studies in European history at Tulane University, after which he joined the faculty at West Georgia University as an assistant professor. Transitioning to politics after his time as a professor, Gingrich served as a U.S. representative for 20 years, as minority whip from 1989 to 1995, and as Speaker of the House from 1995 to 1999. The Speaker is well known for his role in the architecture of the Republican Party's 1994 Contract with America, a 10-point political strategy for the nation. In May of 2011, Gingrich announced, announced his intention to run for president in the 2012 election. He was a front runner during the Republican primary and won the primaries in South Carolina and Georgia. As an evolutionary biologist, I was fascinated to learn that in addition to his long list of political accomplishments, the speaker is also a paleontology and dinosaur enthusiast. Mr. Axelrod, a University of Chicago alumnus, started his career as a journalist at the Chicago Tribune and became the youngest political writer at the Tribune in 1981. After eight years at the Tribune, Mr. Axelrod then turned to working on campaigns in Chicago and around the country for over 20 years. During the 2008 campaign, Mr. Axelrod worked as President Obama's chief strategist, then served as senior advisor in the White House from 2009 to 2011, and then as senior strategist for Obama's 2012 campaign. Mr. Axelrod has now returned to his alma mater to found the Institute of Politics with the mission to bring non-curricular opportunities to University of Chicago students interested in public and social service. This is a very auspicious time to be a student interested in politics at the University of Chicago. As such, I had the incredible opportunity to take part in a conversation with former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright and 20 other female students from across the university. She reminded the women in the room that we are especially lucky that Mr. Axelrod, a person so dedicated to public service, has established the Institute of Politics here to encourage and support students who wish to go into public policy and policy making. Please join me in welcoming Speaker Gingrich and Mr. Axelrod. Thank you. I have to. Uh confess that we had lunch together today and spent two hours speaking, so you're catching this conversation two hours in. Uh, and we had, a, we had a great conversation then, and I'm looking forward to continuing it now, and maybe we'll cover a little bit of what we uh, talked about then. But let me say as a uh, preamble, I've run my last campaign. Uh, I don't know about you. Have you run your last campaign? Yeah, I, I don't plan to run a campaign. Okay. Or run, or run as a candidate that in a That was a different question. Oh, I, I see. Because <laughs> I was going to say, if you said yes to that, then we could uh, certify that we could have a candid conversation. Uh, but, uh, but I'm sure, knowing you, that we will anyway. Um, yeah, I can't help myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Mr. Speaker, we're in the midst here at the University of Chicago uh, of a uh, five-week uh, five review of the presidential race the 2012 presidential race. I know that you said after the election that you wanted to take six months to review the presidential race. We're now about three months in. So uh, can you give us at least half of your observations yeah. about, about that well, election? What, what happened it, it, in part, 2012? Part of is you won. So you can review it in five weeks. <laughs> uh, we lost in ways, and, and, and uh, I really thought we would win because I really bought the economic argument that the economy is bad enough, et cetera. And Calista and I, and my wife is sitting down here, but Calista and I really only began to realize we were gonna lose about 5.30 on election day. 
when we called into a Frank Luntz call. And Luntz was going through the exit polls. And after about six states, we just stared at each other. And then when he got done with his call, we hung up and we had a glass of wine, not to celebrate, but to realize this was going to be a really long evening. And as I watched the evening progress, I mean, it, and people need to remember, we lost Montana, um, North Dakota, Wisconsin, center races, center races um, Ohio, Pennsylvania, uh, Indiana, Missouri, Virginia, Florida. And you, and you look at this level of, of disaster, and, and you look at the presidential race, and, you have, and the way I describe it is I'm like a pilot whose plane hit a mountain, and I'm beginning to think we need new radar. <laughs> and so we've set out at Gingrich Productions to go through very methodically, uh, not, not so much what you guys did right and we did wrong, although I think it's very instructive, and I think you all ran your, your really second brilliant campaign uh, after the campaign for the nomination in 08. Um, but in addition, there are large chunks of the Republican Party that are totally out of sync with the 21st century. And confronting that, thinking it through, is a very sobering thing. And then trying to figure out how you're going to start changing it is, is equally big, I think, as a, as a challenge for us. And so it's, a, it's, a, it's intellectually a very interesting project, and it's a pretty formidable project. You know, um, as we were thinking about the race, in fact, I remember back in, uh, on the day of our own debacle, the 2010 uh, campaign, um, the uh, saying of the president, I think the seeds of your reelection have just been planted. And I thought that because, A, we kind of anticipate maybe a little bit of overreach on the part of the, the new uh, Republican Congress. But more than that, it seemed like the forces that had seized control of the party apparatus or the nominating apparatus were uh, going to put a focus on issues like um, abortion and choice, uh, on uh, immigration, on gay marriage, on um, issues that uh, we felt would help galvanize uh, constituencies. Um, how much was the Republican primary process uh, damaging to the ultimate prospects? Of, now, you stood there on the stage. You heard these debates. What were you thinking when these debates were going on about what this meant for the prospects of the party? Well, let me, let me start and <clears throat> pay you an additional tribute. When we won in 94. So far, this conversation is going very well, by the way. <laughs> yeah, well, I, mean, I think, look, I, I think you have a lot to be very proud of. And, and uh, thank you. E even if I disagree deeply with why, what you did with power when you got it, <laughs> nonetheless, your ability to acquire it has been very impressive <laughs> and is worth studying. Um, <clears throat> but but if, you, if you take the parallel with Clinton, when we win in 94, Clinton goes through about a six month agonizing period in the White House and comes to the correct conclusion that if he takes us head on, he'll lose the presidency. And this is the period when, when, when Hillary brings in Dick Morris, and, and Clinton says to his liberal staff, look, if I do what you want me to do, I'll get beat. I got beat in 1980. It's not fun to get beat. I'm not going to get beat. And so he walks in and says, the era of big government's over. What's impressive with what you all did, and, and part of what mis, misinformed me in terms of how I an analyzed it was, you know, the president didn't say, oh, gee, let me run over here and become a lot more moderate and let me cut a deal. The president said, these guys are nuts. I'm going to take them head on. I'd rather get nothing done and fight with them for two years and then let the country choose. Now, that, with, given the economy you had inherited and the problems you had economically, that was both a very bold, a very courageous decision uh, and a f moderately improbable decision. So, so in that sense, there were some very interesting different dynamics between 95, 96, and, and 09, and, I mean, and, and 11 and 12. Uh, now, in terms of your question, I, th I think it hurt, but I don't think it necessarily hurt for the same reason you, you suggest. I think it hurt because our ultimate nominee was really clumsy. And, and, and I, look, I, I don't mean this to sound as... as, as uh, tough on Romney as it's going to, but I think, I think the honest, objective reality is you don't have to pick a fight with Rick Perry 
over paying for kids to go to college and then pivot and pick a fight with me over deporting grandmothers. I mean, I tried to set it up so that in, a, in chess terms it was a fork. I mean, it was emotionally inconceivable. And both Santorum and Romney took, I mean, took me, if you go back and look at the video, we're, we're standing in the Daughters of the American Revolution Hall and we're having this debate and I say, let's be honest and realistic about immigration. We are not going to deport somebody who's been here 25 years and has grandchildren. And Romney says, well, they'll self-deport. And I, you know, now, now I just want to say to all of you, I mean, this, this is an example, this is why I'm, I'm frankly taking on the old order in my own party. It is anti-human to suggest that you can go into a community and say, you know, I'm going to deport your grandmother, but I've got a great jobs program. Uh, and Reince Priebus, our national chairman, has it exactly right. Priebus says, immigration is never the number one issue unless the issue is immigration. But the minute the issue is immigration, it's the number one issue if you're Latino. And it turns out, by the way, it's equally devastating for Asian Americans because Romney got fewer votes among Asian Americans than he did among Latino Americans. Now, given values of entrepreneurship, work ethic, take home pay, throwing away the Asian American vote is an art form that people will study in future years as, as a case study in a party being self-destructive. I mean, it's just mindless. Well, on that point, do you think that all your, all your uh, colleagues uh, in the Republican Party in the Congress have internalized that message? Not all of them. I mean, as you know from your own members, there are, I mean, I don't want to speak ill of the Democratic Party, but there are some members of your Is caucus. this a new thing? Or? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're in a post-election. So we're in an academic environment yes. where I feel free to speak candidly because <laughs> I'm, here, I'm here with my neutral moderator friend. <laughs> so I was going to say, as you know, you have some members of your caucus yes. who probably aren't as reasonable about anything as they could be. Well, so we have some of those. I do think what's happened, I do think, and this is part of the way a free society should work, you, and you have to give McCain and Bush and, and Teddy Kennedy some credit for having started this. The conversation we've been having now over the last six years, the country has talked to itself a lot, and the country isn't where it was six years ago. And part of it is a practicality. I mean, people have finally come to grips with the idea, on the one hand, yes, we should control the border. On the other hand, we're not going to deport 11 million people. I mean, I think you'll find overwhelming agreement. We're not going to deport 11 million people. It's, not, it's physically impossible. And so that now starts a new conversation. Because if you accept those, those things to be true, you then just start to say, OK, so how can you find some method of getting to legality and to orderly structure? without necessarily automatically agreeing to citizenship. And so I think you now start a negotiation and a conversation that is very different than it would have been four or five years ago. And I would say Rick Perry got that. Jeb Bush certainly got it. Having Marco Rubio in the Senate is a huge help on this because he's able to push and lead in ways that a lot of other members wouldn't. Uh, but even people, and Rand Paul has come a very long distance towards trying to be helpful on this issue. So is your prediction that it will get done? I think that's entirely up to your former boss. Uh, if President Obama- They just got scolded by uh, Senator Rubio for- right. and, and I think this is very important, and it's a lesson that the Bush people would not learn in 05, when they, when they brought out the Bush Social Security Plan. And I said to them the minute they did it, this is, this is I said, you can, you can build an airplane or you can build a bridge. If you build a bridge and you throw it in the air, you don't have an airplane. You have a bridge which is about to fall. I said, you cannot come out of an election with a narrow margin and have a plan named for the guy who barely won and not automatically polarize half the country. So the president has the same problem. No Republican trusts this president, none, not one. So if there is an Obama push on immigration, he makes it less likely. If on the other hand he says, I really hope the House and Senate Democrats and the House and Senate Republicans will work together to produce a bill I can sign. And I'm going to be very patient and back off for six months, but I really hope you all will set a date and try to get something passed. I think the odds are pretty good that by the August recess, they would have passed something in the House and Senate 
and by December they will actually pass a conference report. Would that have happened without the 2012 election? No. So let's get back to the election for a second, because this wasn't the only issue that got uh, debated vigorously during the primaries. Uh, the whole issue of contraception, women's health, became a rather large issue in the campaign. Uh, how, how big did that play? You know, you've already pointed out some of the numbers. Um, the, uh, uh, the president won 71% of Latinos, but he also had this 11-point gender gap, pretty much what he had, you know, just slightly less than he had four years earlier. Tell me about that. And I'm really I'm kind of interested, because you are uh, a guy with very keen political instincts. As these debates were unfolding, what were you, what were you thinking? Well, this, we're working on a paper right now at Gingrich Productions on, uh, which I'm having to change because of our conversation backstage. Um, because I, I, I thought actually it was a strategy. And if it was just a series of random things that evolved, then I've got to write a new paper. But the, the, for all of you, what happens is HHS decides in uh, November of 2011 that they're going to issue some regulations about implementation of Obamacare that includes contraception and includes certain specific things that are guaranteed to get the Catholic Church and fundamentalist Protestants and Orthodox Jews all upset. And so that starts down the road. And then in the last week of November or the first week in December, a newspaper interviews Rick Santorum and says, you know, do you think states can outlaw contraception? And Santorum says, well, I guess under the 10th Amendment they could. Now, none of us actually knew this. It didn't get a whole lot of publicity. So we go into a debate in early February, and, uh, which I think is in, in Iowa. And uh, mm -hmm. George Stephanopoulos is there. And George says, out of the blue, um, to, I think to, he starts with Romney. He, he, said, did, he, he, says, he says, so how do you feel about Connecticut versus Griswold? Now, this is a 1963 Supreme Court case on the right to purchase contraceptives. And every single Republican candidate is staring at Stephanopoulos, thinking he has lost his mind. And thinking, I mean, there had been no serious effort to outlaw contraception, you know, since 1963, when it was not an issue. We're, we're producing this with a tape. It's an 18-minute segment of the debate. And he keeps coming back to it. And I, when we had a break at one point, I walked over to him and I said, George, when you're in a hole, quit digging. Because none of, I mean, we thought he was embarrassing himself. Well, of course, this leads to Sandra Fluke, who, who makes a case which is heard radically differently depending on your ideological background. And, and as you know, uh, she then gets pounded on by people like Rush Limbaugh, which then makes her a heroine among people who care deeply about this issue from a pro-choice standpoint. And now you have the whole war on women, and then you have Romney come out and say, why don't we abolish Planned Parenthood? And now you have a multi-billion dollar institution of, you know, of a very, very high public standing, which I think you could make a good case for, saying the abortion part ought to be spin off and should not get any federal funding. And you, you could argue for Planned Parenthood A and Planned Parenthood B. But when you say let's abolish Planned Parenthood, that is instantaneously turned by every Planned Parenthood organization into they don't care if women die. So now you end up with well, why don't Republicans care that women are dying? Now that, you know, <laughs> and, you, and you stand there and you're going, how did we get to this? And then, of course, you guys cheerfully say, we're going to Charlotte to celebrate the war on women. Uh, you know, and, and by the time you all come out of Charlotte, you know, for those people for whom it's a believable issue, this is over. I mean, you know, I had a friend tell me the other day about a, a woman he knows who's a fairly senior executive who just said to him, well, I couldn't, Repo I couldn't vote for Republicans. They want to wage war on women. Yes, but wasn't this in part a consequence of uh, what Romney felt he needed to do to command the base of the party? One of the weaknesses of trying to assimilate a system you don't understand is you, the Germans have a term for battlefields, what they call fingerspritz and gefühling, uh, to feel the battlefield in your fingertips. 
Okay. Clinton could have a sister soldier moment because Clinton in every fiber of his body understood the Democratic Party. And therefore he knew exactly why it was important to do it. He knew exactly how far he could go to get away with it. And he was quite comfortable facing down Jesse Jackson when he tried to defend Sister Soldier because Clinton had the intuitive balance. If, if you, and any of you have ever done something like, like ballet or in anything where you've got to have a, it's a little bit like riding a bicycle in a sense. You, you've got to have an ability to act without cognition. Because if you have to slow down and you get a mind-body disconnect, you can't, this is why if you're a ballerina, you can't be thinking about what you do next. It has to become a habit so deep, you just do it. Well, Do you still dance, by the way? What? <laughs> well, my granddaughter does it. She and I, she's been explaining all this to me. But, but, the, but the principle of it is that I think Romney and his immediate advisors didn't have a sense at their fingertips of what you could and couldn't do, and so they always operated, I think, with a certain clumsiness. And the clumsiness tended to set the, to, basically they were squandering the general election in order to get to the nomination. Uh, and they right. forgot also, we live in an age where everything you say lives forever. So, so uh, my impression is that one of the commercials you guys ran in, in Spanish language media the last couple weeks of the campaign was actually just Romney explaining self-deportation for grandmothers. We did, um, we did feature him in some advertising <laughs> over, the, over the course of the campaign. Let me ask you about one other element of the, let me ask you about one other element of the, uh, of the uh, primary, that moment and you that- You didn't think that was unkind. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, he said that he didn't have enough money to run campaign ads, so we ran Romney ads. That was really, I, I hadn't yeah. thought of that. This, is, so, um, this, by the way, is a new example of compassion mm -hmm. carried out in a way you wouldn't have expected. Yes. <laughs> so um, let me ask you about one other primary issue. One, probably the most iconic moment in all the debates was when you were asked, all of you were asked the question, would you accept one dollar new taxes for ten dollars of cuts? And everybody raise their hand. Um, we, when you look at the exit polls in the, in the, in, on uh, uh, November 6th, uh, a pretty healthy majority of people said they wanted, they thought that we needed to raise taxes on the wealthiest Americans as part of a, as part of a, a budget resolution, an economic plan. Um, was that a wise, would you put that in the category of these other uh, of these other issues, did that put him in a hole? Did it put well, the party no, that, in that, a hole? That, that's an example where, and, and again, you've got to look at the base of the Republican Party. I mean, if, if, if Romney had come in, or not just Romney, let's, let's not pick on Mitt. If, if candidate X had walked in and said, gee, I have this Candidate great, X, former governor of Massachusetts. Well, no, any candidate. I mean, let's assume we had parachuted in a, 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 a perfect candidate. If that perfect candidate walked in, with an enormous amount of money, let's say Bloomberg, and it said, you know, the way we get through a general election is we're gonna be pro-gay marriage, pro-choice, and I'm gonna raise taxes on the richest Americans. He couldn't have spent enough money to get through the primaries. I mean, the party would have just said, you know, you're, why are you here? You know, so it's a practical political decision. So, so first of all, any, if any one person had said, oh sure, I'll raise taxes, They'd have gotten killed. I mean, everybody else would have pounded on him for endlessly. But second, where, where I think, and this is where Reagan would have been very different. Yes. But, I want but, to ask you about Reagan. Yeah, but, but, but specifically a matter of, of, of thinking about how you communicate. You could have gotten away with a no tax increase pledge if you had spent a fair amount of the summer and fall lovingly outlining waste in the federal government and saying, you know, I, I'd like to, I, I'm willing to pay for whatever government we need but let's look at this, let's look at Solyndra for a while. Now let's look at the next thing. Now let's look at the next thing. And I just can't bring myself to raise more taxes until we finish cleaning up the federal government. As you know, in Gallup and elsewhere, that's about a 70% issue. I mean, you can, you can live a long time off of waste in the federal government, but then you have to make it one of the central thematics. So it's not just that I'm protecting the rich. I mean, I do think nominating a multimillionaire to defend the rich creates a certain 
challenge in effectiveness because it just, it just compounds the problem. Yeah, I want to talk about that in a minute, but, but you raised Reagan. I want to ask you about Reagan. And, and you've, you've, uh, you've served uh, with Reagan. You've written about Reagan. You've done a film about uh, Reagan. You know a lot about him. And you know that as governor of California, um, and we talked about it, he raised taxes. As president, he cut taxes, famously cut taxes, the, but he also raised them 11 times. He appointed Sandra Day O'Connor to the Supreme Court, who was a pro-choice uh, woman. And uh, uh, he, uh, he, engage, he engaged in tax reform uh, and promoted tax reform uh, and treat, uh, that treated capital and wages uh, the same. And said, and went around the country campaigning on the theme of, is it fair for a millionaire to pay a lower tax rate than a bus driver? Could he have gotten nominated in this Republican Party? Sure. With those positions? No. Oh. <laughs> but but he, he didn't win the nomination with those positions. Mm -hmm. And he won the nomination. I mean, first of all, the, uh, and Cliss and I, when we did the film about Reagan, were just going through the material, going out to the library, going up to the ranch, spending time, you know, looking at it. Let, let me give you an example. Reagan decides, is talked into by his staff, to raise, it, to raise taxes in 82 after he'd cut taxes in 81. And it's important to remember that Reagan's tax cut is, is a huge tax cut because we had a 70% marginal rate. So, so it was pretty hard not to say this was a serious tax cut. So he, they decide, they talk him into a tax increase. And the Republican National Committee pays for a 30-minute Reagan speech. And Reagan gives this speech explaining tax increases. Now, I was one of the people opposing him. And we got no phone calls. Because everybody who was for Reagan watched the speech and thought, that was weird. He didn't convince anybody. They said, that was weird. I wonder how, who talked Ronnie into that one. And went back to business as usual. Reagan's capacity, which I, I have never seen, because I, I, maybe FDR had this, but I've never seen it in my lifetime. Reagan's ability was to take you up on the mountaintop and then carry you to the next mountaintop, and you didn't notice any of the valleys in between. And so you just kind of were just blown away by him. He, he was one of the most remarkable performers I've ever seen. Would he have gotten support in uh, today, in today's Congress, would he have gotten the support? Could he deal with this particular Congress on some of those uh, issues? Could he have uh, passed 11? tax increases, could he, how would they have well, reacted they, yeah, to a pro-choice woman nominee for the Supreme Court? Well, for, first of all, remember that Tip O'Neill had a majority the entire time Reagan was president. So he was passing things with Democratic votes. He wasn't passing them uh, with, with Republican votes. He wasn't negotiating with Republican speaker. Uh, and the Republican Senate was much more moderate than the current House is. Um, I think that, that the other thing to remember is Reagan becomes an active anti-communist in 47. He spends eight years at General Electric uh, teaching free enterprise. He does theater. He then runs for governor. He's governor for eight years. He runs briefly for president in 68. He runs intensely for president in 75, 76. By the time he's elected in 1980, there is an entire wing of the party which is gonna help Ronald Reagan. I mean, and, and so you have to go back. There, there is currently a vacuum in the Republican Party of the kind of organic leadership which Reagan provided nationally and which I provided in the House for the first three and a half years of my speakership. And so you don't have anybody who can bring people in a room and say, let me tell you why we're going to do this. But in the midst of that, you, did, you said something that seems obvious, which is that the party has shifted rightward from that time. I think, I think that's right. And I think that's partly in reaction to the country. Uh, that the country is much more polarized, not just, not just the parties, the country is more polarized than it was 20 years ago. Um, just to finish up the uh, one point on this election, I, I know that there was a confab that you spoke at, the Republican National Committee had on uh, the election, and um, one, uh, there, some of the quotes there were, there was one National Committee woman who was quoted in the story I'm looking at, saying, we don't need a new pair of shoes, we just need to shine our shoes. Uh, the chairman, uh, uh, Reince Priebus, said, it's not the platform of the party that's the issue in many cases, it's how we communicate about it. It's, it is a couple dumb things that people have said. 
meaning I presume the Senate candidates in Missouri and the Senate candidates in... Or 47%. Or 47%, yes. Good, good point. Uh, but um, uh, I'm trying to observe my moderator role and I can I know, no, into I appreciate, you. I, appreciate the new, I appreciate the neutrality with which you're <laughs> No, but, you know, uh, and the assertion that was largely held at this conference was that this was mainly a tactical defeat, that technology wasn't up to snuff, that, uh, uh, you know, field organizing wasn't up to snuff, that, that the Obama campaign had simply out-organized the Republican Party. Do you think that the Republican Party's problem is uh, purely a tactical problem? No, and I don't think most of the people at that conference thought that. I think that there are two things going on there. First of all, there is a, there is a minority that basically, I think, is out of touch with reality. And they want to wander around and say, gee, you know, if we, I don't want to pick a fight with the lady who talked about her shoes. But anybody who thinks we are dealing with a cosmetic problem is fundamentally out of touch with the real world. The Republican Party is a very serious challenge. And we have to really profoundly rethink how we operate in the country we're operating in, because we have models in our head our consultants have models that just don't work. They don't fit reality. So that, that part I agree with. Most of the people there, however, were being told by the news media, the definition of change is become a liberal party. You know, why, why don't you become a party the New York Times editorial board will like? Well, we already have a party the New York Times editorial board likes. We don't, this is why Reagan's famous speech in February of 1974, when he goes to CPAC right after the collapse of Watergate, and he says, you know, 75 rather, and he says, we need bold colors, not pale pastels. And he's making the case, is there a Republican Party which can appeal to people under 30? Yeah, that, that doesn't mean you necessarily have to be the liberal party in America. Is there a Republican Party which can reach out to Asian American entrepreneurs and Latino small business owners? Yeah, that does, you know, I mean, there are lots of things you can do that, that are dramatically smarter and better than the Republican Party has been doing them. Some of them are issues, but, but I would argue the greatest need we have in America today is not better marketing of liberalism or conservatism. It is a decade or more of inventing fundamentally big new solutions. And that whichever party can break out and become once again a party of ideas. I had a very senior person in Washington say to me yesterday that in the, in the 60s and early 70s, the Democrats were the party of ideas and the Republicans were the party of no. By the late 70s and the 80s, the Republicans were the party of ideas and the Democrats were the party of no. And that today, neither party is deeply committed to a whole range of no ideas. But I think you could defend the president and argue that's not fair. But I do think you have this sense of, as, as you and I were chatting earlier, these bureaucracies don't work. I don't care if you're a liberal or a conservative. These huge, giant bureaucracies don't work. Now, nobody in Washington is taking seriously how would you overhaul these bureaucracies? as opposed to the Republicans who'd like them to be smaller and the Democrats who'd like them to be bigger. And I think, I think we're right at the edge of, of a really dramatic, bold breakthrough. And whichever party can figure this stuff out, I think we'll, we'll be able to go out in, the, in a Walmart sense or a McDonald's sense, be able to go out and offer the country a lot better product line and will attract people and have a whole new set of arguments that may make a lot of what we think about 2012 substantially less relevant. Well, I mean, one of the debates we're having now is what are the kind of things, what are the investments we have to make, what are the things we have to do to create the kind of economy of the future right. that yields uh, opportunity that, you know, and, I, and you, as you and I have spoke, spoken about this, you agree. I think the president would uh, make that argument. You've got an interesting uh, situation, though, uh, and you, we, we spoke about this as well. One of your colleagues, uh, uh, from your era when you were speaker said uh, when we were, uh, when Newt took over and we were there, we, our attitude was uh, that we wanted, uh, uh, we wanted to limit government, but we understood that there was a role for government. So today there's a class of people uh, there who don't believe that, any, that, there should be, that there should be any government, that there's no role for government. How do you see the role of government? What, is the pro oh. what are the proper things that government should be doing right now? First of all, every time I run into somebody who says to me, we don't need government, I just say, terrific, so you don't want to control the border. Oh, no, of course you have to control the border. Who do you think is going to control the border? And you get, it's like, like the lady who once said, keep government out of my Medicare. Right. 
I mean, yeah, that was the most, <coughs> most interesting poster of the whole healthcare debate. That was a John Bro comment. He said, going through the airport, this lady yells at him, don't you touch my Medicare. I don't want you to have government get near it. <coughs> so you start with that. I, I think what, what is lacking today is on the right, which is different than, than the problems of the left. I mean, the left, I think, has a challenge of how do you reform the bureaucracies which elect you, whether it's this school union here in Chicago or whether it's just the scale of, say, the Department of Homeland Security. The right has a different problem. The right has no clear sense of the society we would want to create and which portions of that society are government, which portions are, are the, uh, the, the, the uh, charitable sector, if you will, or civil society, and then which portions are genuinely private. And so I think we are a cycle out of step right now in offering a positive vision of a dramatically better future. And, it, and it's frankly hard to do. I mean, I'll, I'll just give you one of my, my, my most famous uh, mistake uh, out of several, um, was, uh, which close to occasion reminds me of, was when <laughs> I, I, we went to the, the Space Coast and I talked about a lunar colony. And, and lunar colony was exactly the right phrase because it was small enough that reporters could, you know, could figure it out. And Saturday Night Live could, <laughs> Saturday Night Live could use it and my opponents could attack it. But what I couldn't get across was, I'll just give you one example. There is a firm trying to build a private sector path back to the moon. They believe they can do it for 10% of the NASA proposal. Uh, there is, the head of, of British Virgin Airlines, or Virgin Airlines is now building a near space program that will be dramatically different. And, and he was telling Calista when we were with him in October, he plans to take his entire family, uh, probably by next summer, probably from a spaceport in New Mexico. Uh, there are a hundred things going on in space that aren't big government writing slow papers for pork barrel dominated agencies in which the members of the, of the space committee all are on there purely to get pork for their state. I mean, so so you're, you're, you have a chance to break loose in a way that's very exciting. Two examples I kept telling students today, uh, both involve Sebastian Thrun, who is an engineer at Google. One is uh, the Google driverless car, uh, which is now technically legal in California, Nevada, and Florida. If they break through and actually build a car that is safe, that drives itself, first of all, you really enhance life for people like a friend of ours who is in his 70s with macular degeneration and would now be able to go and, and still have mobility even though he can't see very well. Second, for those of you who have known, who have friends, none of you, but who have friends who on occasion have drunk too much, having a car that could get you home without you either getting a DUI or hitting somebody is a big deal. If you look at what, let's say you got driverless cars that, that reduced accident rates by 90%. Take a look at what that does to the American economy. The second thing Thrun has done though, which may be even more radical, She's founded a firm called Udacity, which you can Google. Uh, and Udacity's commitment is to lower the tuition rate for higher education by 90%. They just, Jerry Brown, who will be here, uh, just uh, signed an agreement to allow San Jose State to work with Udacity to offer the first 300 students an ability to get a four-year degree uh, with a very, very different approach. University of Wisconsin just announced they're going to create a four-year online degree with no residency requirements. Uh, I mean, you're really seeing the beginning of breakthroughs that, you know, and what I wanted to do is attach to unemployment compensation a learning requirement because 99 weeks of unemployment is the equivalent of an associate degree. Uh, yet today we just throw the money away. So there are things you could do that would really break through. I, I will point out that on some of these issues, you and the president uh, are, agree. And on one well, of these... I, by the way, I had that experience with the last Democratic president. I mean, yes. there, are, there are a lot of things. People who are relatively interested in the future have a convergence, even if they start from different places. We had one discussion a little earlier today, and since you uh, introduced <coughs> your wife, let me introduce my wife, Susan, who spends most of her time uh, trying to solve uh, the scourge of epilepsy. Uh, and we talked about brain research. And, you know, the president. Uh, there was a story the other day that he's planning an initiative to, a uh, 10 year initiative to really map the brain so we can understand what the source of these uh, diseases and disorders are. Uh, you're 
very active in that area. Is that an appropriate role for the federal government? <coughs> Excuse me. It's a very appropriate role for the federal government to empower it and to resource it. It may or may not be totally appropriate to keep it trapped at NIH. Remember, we built the transcontinental railroads without a federal department of railroad building. I think it's very important to understand. You can, you can, we, we created the airline industry in part by having deliberately subsidized uh, airmail, which we paid the airlines to carry in order to subsidize the rise of airlines. There are a lot of ways you could do this. I think to set a goal, and I've, I've really wanted to do this, to set a goal for a very aggressive, large brain science program or brain research program, to recognize that a big chunk of it is a National Science Foundation. If you don't get breakthroughs in mathematics and computing, you can't handle the volume of data you're going to generate. Uh, a lot of it ought to be done in the private sector. Part of it involves reforming the Food and Drug Administration, which is a major hindrance to breakthroughs both in regenerative medicine and in, and in brain science. Uh, so there, there are steps you could take, but certainly the federal government should play a major role in orchestrating and in accelerating the development of it. Because we're having this debate right now about the sequester, a lot of discussion about the deficits. Uh, the sequester would cut into medical research sure. and re other kinds of research uh, and development. It would cut back on education, and I, uh, you know, I assume that you're a strong supporter of uh, a, a, a big investment in education. Uh, is this the right way to go? No, but I, I'm actually for the sequester at this stage uh, because I think there are moments in life when democracies do things really badly but you have to choose between doing them really badly and not doing them. And I think we have been messing around with getting spending under control for the last four or five years. Both parties have been playing games. And I think there's a certain virtue, and, and this will be a mess. But I think it may be necessary to live through the mess to get to the next stage. I, I've, and look, I've, I've said to some senior people in the Defense Department, they ought to use this as an excuse to fundamentally overhaul the Defense Department and to fundamentally overhaul the intelligence community. I mean, when you get overruns like the F-35, all of us should be enraged. I'm a hawk, but I'm a cheap hawk. And, and you're going to have Gary Hart here this, this spring. Uh, Gary and I co-founded the Military Reform Caucus in 1981. And so I would say to you the same thing with medical research. I mean, I, I very much would like to see people figure out, OK, can we come back in and pick the things that matter so much that we're going to either re because you can always reinstate things. But, but I would rather, I'd rather have them accept the sequester and very carefully select things to reinstate. And the reason is simple. The Congress in both parties is so dedicated to pork barrel defense of spending no matter how stupid that you've, it's almost impossible to get a, a bill that cuts anything through because everybody protects themselves. They're now going to face a mess. And I think that may be the only way you break open the system and get it to start functioning. Yeah, I think that the counter argument is that uh, the mess is going to be hard to remedy uh, after it. It's going to be hard to put the, the, the puzzle back together afterwards, even in a more uh, sensible way. And that would be better to go forward in a balanced way. Do you believe that, um, uh, that there should be additional revenues? Should tax reform produce I'm, revenues to help reduce these no, deficits? No, tax reform ought to produce dramatically lower rates. I'm for, a lot, I'm for a lot more revenues. We tried to get uh, some, some space last year for a study that indicated if we were aggressive in using federal land for oil and gas, we could generate about $58 billion a year in additional revenue just from that one source. So there are a number of places where I would look at that. I, I also helped publish a book four years ago called Stop Paying the Crooks because we believe that Medicare and Medicaid has somewhere between 70 and $110 billion a year in fraud. Because what you have is a paper-based center for Medicare and Medicaid services and crooks who buy iPads. And, and the scale is unbelievable. They just figured out, and the administration did this and deserves some credit for it, they just figured out they've been overpaying New York State and Medicaid by $15 billion. Because the administrative process is so incompetent. Yeah, and they've increased prosecutions dramatically yeah. uh, as a result of that and some other measures. You know, when you started moving, and I want to deal with two issues relative to the campaign. You were counted out of the campaign by the, uh, by the uh, pundits in June of uh, 2011. Yep. Your staff quit. You were out of money. 
you leveraged your way back in through debates, essentially, the Republican debates. Uh, you started to make a move in uh, Iowa. Uh, and in fact, you, you predicted that you were going to win the nomination at that point. And there were people who didn't disagree, felt that you had a strong chance. And then you got hit with $4 million in negative ads from super PACs, uh, the Restore Our Future super PACs. I still don't understand the phrase, Restore Our Future, but, um, <laughs> but anyway, um, you, got hit, you got hit with uh, four million, you got set back, you came back again. But you also then got help from your own super PAC and 10 million and ultimately, was it 20 from Sheldon mm -hmm. Adelson, Some. one, one uh, donor. And you bloodied uh, Governor Romney. Uh, and then ultimately, you won South Carolina. And then he ran $20 million of ads against you in Florida, uh, virtually all of it negative. Uh, toward you, very no positive ads. Uh, and that was essentially the end of your uh, candidacy. Is this any way to run a democracy? No, I preferred one where I won. <laughs> but but, but I'll, look, look, I mean, for, first of all, one of the lessons we learned was that 16 billionaires beat one. So Romney was able to accumulate more billionaires. Um, on the other hand, this is the freest, most open system for talent on the planet. You know, I mean, think, think about the last generation. We produce a president who's a peanut farmer slash nuclear engineer. He then gets beaten by a president who once made movies with chimpanzees. He's then replaced by a genuine Yale, you know, upper class Texan who loves pork rind. He then gets beaten by this guy from Arkansas who's actually a Yale Oxford very smart guy, but he's a governor. I mean, there's, there's, there's no society on the planet, or I shouldn't say that, none of the Western industrial democracies would have had a space for Bill Clinton to rise to the top because he's just so clearly an outsider. Then he finally is replaced by the second wave of the Yale, uh, Texas uh, group, although this time it's actually much more Texas than the first time. Uh, and then he gets replaced by the first African-American who in a perfect, perfect American model um, turns out to be a absolute advocate of the poor based on his childhood in Hawaii where he felt deep discri discrimination for not being discriminated against while he went to the most expensive prep school in Hawaii on the way to Columbia and Harvard to finally get to the University of Chicago where he could suffer diligently on behalf of the poor before he ran for office so that he could show up as, this is the perfect no, American no. story. That, I mean, seems like a real, that seems like a really fair characterization. Yeah, I thought, you know. <laughs> well, listen, I had a brief moment here in Chicago, how you had to take it, you know? But, but, but I would say the same thing of Reagan. I mean, no, no, but, yeah. but, but I'm asking a specific question. None of those people got elected in the era of super PACs, where you- Well, Obama where, just did. Well, right, I'm talking about initially, and many of those others, there were no super PACs in, uh, in 2008, all, yes, we you, had, you, yes. could, you could have had as many people savage Hillary as she could have savage you. Right, but, I'm, but specifically in your case, I mean... Well, I felt bad about it. So if you had as many, if you had as many you're saying if you had as more billionaires, you could have won that election. I, I'm, I'm not sure. There's something that happened that we didn't understand, okay? And I, I mean... And, and part of this, candidly, I think, is, is, is what happened in particular with Fox News, that there was, there, was a, there was a sense that the number one requirement on the Republican side was to beat Obama, and whoever was going to, because we found, for example, the more I hit Romney, the weaker I got. So he could hit me, and he didn't get weaker. But if I hit him, I got weaker. And the reason was people had begun to coalesce around the idea, we want someone who can beat Obama. And, we began, and they began to think Romney could beat Obama. And they were told every day, Romney can beat Obama. And so they said, don't mess up the chance to beat Obama. We don't want to hear about you know, Romney care. We don't want to hear about Bain Capital. We don't, and, and the other place, frankly, where, where you could get away with it and I couldn't was a conservative attacking Romney over Bain Capital sounded like Obama. And so you-, you Do you think it was a legitimate attack? Absolutely. I, look, I think the idea is somebody who runs for president and says, my number one criteria for being the, the candidate is I'm a great businessman and no, you can't look at my business. 
I mean, that's insane. No, I, mean, I agree. Be like, I agree. be like Hegel suggesting nobody should actually know where his money comes from. I mean, there are things you just have to stop and say, give me a break. Mm -hmm. I thought it was totally fair, I thought, and I also thought you guys would do it. So it didn't strike me that it was inappropriate. But inside our echo chamber, it became, how can Gingrich be attacking capitalism? And, and it was a really amazing amount of counter pressure, literally overnight. But do you think there is any consequence to one guy giving you $20 million that allowed you to live. Without his $20 million, you would have been out of the race sooner. I assume you acknowledge sure, that. Sure, I agree with that. Uh, is it healthy to have that level of obligation to one, in this case, casino owner in, in Vegas, but it could be anybody, right? Well, first of all, I don't, I don't, all good presidential candidates will tell you they don't feel any obligation. I mean, Sheldon Adelson and Miriam Adelson like us in part because they are desperately concerned about the survival of Israel, and they think that I would have been the strongest candidate in making sure Israel survived. Now, that had nothing to do with how much money they did or didn't give me, uh, and it certainly didn't change any of my views on anything. Uh, and we've actually never had a substantive conversation about, for example, casinos or anything else. The, the question you have to ask is in a free, and I actually think we've gone way down the wrong road, and I'm intrigued to see what the Supreme Court's now doing. Mm -hmm. I think everything. The Supreme Court will, took the case today on whether whether limits or not the, on, the limits are constitutional. Well, yeah, I, I think I think they're that. not constitutional. I think we would be incredibly healthier if we said anybody can give any amount of after-tax income to the candidate as long as it was reported every yeah, night on the internet. Yeah. I think the system would become first of all, you candidates couldn't run ads that are as vicious as these right, super PACs, because right. you just, the country punishes right. you for it. Uh, and, and I found one of the most frustrating things was to go through this dance where my opponent would say, oh gee, I didn't have anything to do with the super PAC being run by my former campaign manager. Right. And I don't know why you would think I would have any responsibility for the trash and dishonesty he's displaying no. at his super PAC. Uh, look, I've always believed that uh, every time we make a campaign finance reform, the system mutates and adjusts to it creates a cottage industry for lawyers. Um, you know, I don't, I don't, I think it's all this money in politics is unhealthy, but I think it's a reality. And if it's gonna be a reality, I agree with you, let it be fully disclosed, let it go to the candidates, let the candidates take responsibility for what they've and, and done. And what it really does, what I think you and I would agree totally is, real campaign openness will give middle class candidates a chance to go out to people and raise the money to compete. When I watch Bloomberg, by the mayorship, and in his third race, there is no other characterization. He won that third election by just buying it. I think that resembles Rome. I think that resembles an oligarchy, and, and uh, he's now in your city, spending a couple million dollars expressing himself in the special election. What happened to democracy in the ability to express yourself. I, th I think, well I, well, I think we should have the ability to express ourselves. I would just like everybody else to be able to match Bloomberg. And I think that's, and the danger you have today is, if you're really rich, you can find ways around this, and if you're really middle class, you can't possibly raise the resources. Yeah, but it sounds like you think that that is acceptable as part of democracy if the billionaire who's spending the money agrees with you. No, no, I'm saying I think it's totally appropriate as long as everybody has access to resources. Let me, um, let me just, um uh, ask a couple more because I see the microphone setting up. I want to give people a chance uh, to ask questions. When you were rising in the polls, some smart ass in the Obama campaign called you the godfather of gridlock. And I think I was the smart ass. Uh, do, you, do you feel bad about it now? <laughs> uh, no. Um, and the reason I said that was because, I mean, you are. Uh, a his historical figure for many reasons, but one is that you took over a moribund Republican caucus right. in the House, and you essentially waged a war on Clinton for a couple of years. Let me just read you this um, uh, from, uh, uh, from Norm Ornstein, and you know, react to it, as I'm sure you will. The Republican, the Republican strategy in 93 and 94, Norm Ornstein from the American Enterprise Institute, which is, a, as this article notes, a conservative think tank. 
The Republican strategy in 93 and 94 was to vote as a parliamentary minority in unison against the new president's initiatives, and that was, much or, uh, that was as much or more Newt's idea as anybody, said Norm uh, Ornstein. Clinton's economic program, his first big initiative, took almost eight months to pass, denying him a big early victory and making the eventual passage look like a humiliation. The same approach had success uh, with a crime bill and, of course, with health care reform. And then just before I... There was another story about this particular administration and a dinner that took place the night uh, of the inauguration where you met with uh, 15 leaders of Congress uh, and uh, to talk about how to deal with Obama and how to, uh, in, in, in the characterization of this story, submarine his, his presidency. And this is what it says. The dinner lasted nearly four hours. They parted com company almost giddily. The Republicans had agreed on a way forward, go after Geithner, and indeed Kyle did the next day. Would you answer my question rather than dancing around it, please? Show united and yielding opposition to the president's economic policies. Eight days later, minority whip Cantor would hold the House Republicans to a unanimous no against Obama's Republican, uh, economic stimulus plan, begin attacking vulnerable Democrats on the airwaves. Uh, win the spear, uh, the spear point of the House in 2010, jab Obama relentlessly in 2011, win the White House and the Senate in 2012. You will remember this day, Draper reports, Newt Gingrich is saying on the way out, you will remember this is the day the seeds of 2012 were sown. So I guess my question is, how'd that work out? Very good in 2010 and not as good right. in 2012. It's an honest answer. Yeah. But I mean, my question is this, we have, <coughs> we have as you pointed out, this very polarized Congress. Uh, some of it has to do with the way we elect Congress, uh, wow. because 80% so of them never face a general election campaign. Um, so you have this, uh, you have this uh, situation where you have members who, who only fear uh, the most strident voices in their own party, and, they, and it makes it harder uh, to compromise. How do we, since, since you've been a student of this and a participant in this, how do we remedy that? We well, do a couple of things. And one is somebody sooner or later will figure out that you need to be in the in, in, in primaries because after all, none of these none of these folks are safe in a primary, and and so the answer to gerrymandering ultimately is going to be very contested primaries, and and that will change a lot of the dynamic in this country. Uh, the second thing is. If you go back to what, what, what we actually said, when, when Clist and I left the uh, Capitol at the first inaugural, Cl Obama, President Obama had had a great speech uh, at Manassas just before the election, a great speech at Grant Park, and I thought a very effective uh, inaugural address. And I said at that point, if he governs the way these three speeches are outlined, he will become Eisenhower and he will split the Republican Party. If, on the other hand, he does what Clinton did, because Clinton has a famous dinner in, in Little Rock and is convinced in November of, of uh, 1993, 1992 by Mitchell and Gephardt and Foley to move to the left and pass the Congressional Democrats' agenda. I said, if, if he goes to the left, then we can polarize against him. But you got, I mean, the president's a little bit like a pitcher in baseball. He, he always controls what the next pitch is. Uh, just it's the nature of our system. Now, we, so we were prepared and we had thought through how to keep the pressure, which I think, frankly, is our job. I, mean, I think the job of the opposition party is to effectively, intelligently oppose and, and to, to keep the majority party on its toes. When the president decides to write a stimulus package with no Republican involved, and they pass it in the House before any elected official has, has, has read it, he just, I mean, the well just became poison. You have the same thing going on right now. If this president, I'll give you an example that's almost silly, all right? Given what we know of John Boehner. Let me just say, if people have questions, they should line up now. Okay. I don't want to... If this president had taken Boehner with him to play Tiger Woods, you'd be in a dramatically better situation today. Human ties matter. And, and the gap between the two parties is this big right? I think the gap is actually bigger between the White House and the Republicans than it is in the Congress. I think you're going to find congressional Democrats and congressional Republicans working together because, frankly, both sides are sick of it. I mean, I have Democrats tell me all the time, they're just sick of it. And I think you're actually going to find people getting together 
just to try to find a way to break out of the gridlock. Mr. Speaker, uh, just a couple of points on that. I was there, so I was there, I think I would, maybe was with the President when he went over to the House caucus to talk about the Recovery Act, and uh, the release went out saying that they were going to vote against en masse before he got there. So, and there was a great interview with, uh, with Mitch McConnell in January of 2010 in which he said, we made a strategic decision not to give the President any support on any major issue because if we did it would signify that he had figured it out and we didn't want to give him uh, that. Was there not an effort to deprive him of the, uh, of the, the victory of, of, of defeating gridlock, which was of course one of the great promises of his campaign? I think that was one of the keys to the victory in 2010 was independent voters saying he said he was going to end gridlock and he end, instead had to pass things on a party line vote. I thought it was a very clever strategy, was it not? Well, I think, I think it's a useful strategy, but if you'll notice in 1993-94, we pivoted and ran on the contract with America. We entered office and, and, and in the first term of, as a speaker, we passed welfare reform, which is still the largest, other than Obamacare, is the largest social reform in your lifetime. And we then were able to work to pass four consecutive balanced budgets. So it partly depends on, on what you do with the maneuvering. Uh, I think the president- Did they fail to the Republicans by not presenting any, uh, anything but an opposition? Absolutely, a force? huge mistake to be the party of opposition. A good example is something that was said uh, uh, by, by um, uh, Stuart Stevens on, on Sunday when we did me, we, this week together, and he said, well, Obamacare was really popular among Latinos, so even if we'd been okay on immigration, we still wouldn't have done very well because they were the one group that really cared about Obamacare. And I just wrote a newsletter and I, and I said, you know, what he just said to us was the absence of a Republican alternative on health care that would allow people to believe they could have decent health care without having to have Obamacare means it's either Obamacare or nothing. Well, a party which ends up saying, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm against all the following things you're currently getting and I have no substitute. There's a party which is gonna get beat. Because people you said something else in that us. newsletter. Uh, Karl Rove has now said that he's gonna organize uh, his super PAC to oppose uh, Republicans who he feels are um, problematical in a general election in the primary. You said you have to win those primaries uh, in order to change things. Uh, do you support his effort? I think, I think it is uh, abhorrent to have some political professional boss in Washington, D.C. announce he's going to raise millions from billionaires to destroy candidates in 50 states based on his assessment. I think it is, it is anti everything that the historic Republican Party stood for, uh, and, and I really am deeply opposed to doing it. Let me just get one thing off my chest, and then we'll take... Uh questions. I, I, I couldn't forgive myself if, uh, if I didn't ask this. Uh, when you said, what if Obama is so outside our comprehension that only if you understand Kenyan anti-colonial behavior can you begin to piece together his actions? That is the most accurate predictive model for his behavior. What the heck does that mean? You, you have to see the movie 2016 and you have, to read, you have to read Dinesh D'Souza's book. That was actually a random conversation about Dinesh D'Souza's book. Yeah, I know. I, I, I knew what the context of it was, but I raise it because... Okay, I, let me give you a specific, serious answer. I think it's very hard to understand his Cairo speech and, and, and to try to figure out where, where did that come from, parts of which are just plain factually false, but I believe, he, I believe the president believes it. Yeah, I don't think it... First of all, I think it came from a recognition of, uh, of, of, of where the world is now, but... Uh, it certainly didn't come from uh, Kenyan anti-colonial behavior. After all, his father left when he was two. So I don't think that was, that was the influence. But here's my bigger point. Does it concern you that the president won self-described moderates 56 to 41? No, I think people look, I, who I think apparently you, didn't know it. I think this president ran a brilliant campaign and became acceptable to a very broad number of people and deserves the respect of every American for having, in a time of very bad economic trouble, earned the presidency again. All right, I'm willing to stop right there. Can we, uh, can we take some questions? <coughs> I was gonna say, it ain't getting better than that, David, so we should move. Yes, on. exactly, no, I'm, I'm happy. Let's go. Uh, 
Hi, my name is Benjamin Field, and I'm a third year at the college. First, I just want to say, Mr. Gingrich, such an honor to have you here. Um, I come from a family where my father often describes himself as an old-fashioned Republican. He's very, very pro-business, but very, very socially liberal. So much, though, that when Bush won the election in 2000, I remember him taking me down to the county offices and switching his party to Democratic because of the Republicans' newer views on social issues. My question to you is, do you ever see a day when a socially liberal wing will return to the Republican Party? And if so, when do you think that's going to happen? I, th I think it is beginning to happen. I think it will continue to evolve. Uh, you saw it with people like Scott Brown. I think in some ways Chris Christie comes closer to that model. And I think you'll, you will see a continuation in that direction. But I mean, but clearly we're going to be if you look at it over the next 25 years, barring some really strange thing happening, we will remain the largely conservative party in America. Democrats will remain the largely liberal party in America. But I think it'll be in a, in a broader sense than you've seen recently. We may not make your father happy, though. Hi, my name is Michael Willey. Uh, I worked on the Romney campaign. I was a field manager in Cuyahoga County. And I just wanted to mm -hmm. say, uh, you, I have tremendous respect for the Obama campaign. Your guys' organization um, and data analysis to target voters completely destroyed us. Is, uh, is Jeremy Bird here? Where are you? Stand, stand up if you're here. Oh, he's up there. Well done. Our field, uh, our, our crack field director, national field director, and uh, he, uh, give, him a, give him a hand. Uh. And um, my question is, was actually about a comment um, Speaker Gingrich made about we need a big, bold solutions over the next decade. And given the changing demographics, which haven't been mentioned, um, I think one area that the Republicans should look at is school choice. And you saw Marco Rubio introduce uh, a tax credit bill at the national level uh, recently. Do you think that's something Republicans can use to reach out to minority voters that they've neglected in the past? Yeah, I, I think that's a piece of it. And I, I, was, I participated with uh, Governor Tommy Thompson when he first developed it, actually with the Jesse Jackson state chair in Wisconsin, a woman who had been a single mother and lived in public housing and, and was a, a Democrat uh, state legislator. Uh, and I do think that's an example. I, I, I would say the same thing, by the way, in terms of the president's current drive to have, um, have, a, to have preschool is I'd love to see Republicans come back and say, what if we made it a voucher? And you could either use it yourself if you wanted to home preschool, or you could use it at a church-related institution or a private institution, or you could take them to a public one. But why, why allow yourself to get trapped into a fight where your choice is a unionized public bureaucracy or nothing? Uh, and so I think there are a lot of ways you can deal with these issues. Hi, I'm Max Vissio, and I'm a third year. Um, as someone who knows what he's talking about, how would you critique uh, John Boehner's speakership? <laughs> Look, I, I think John Boehner has a very, very great challenge. And I, and I don't, I mean, I've said it to people before, I don't know that I could do any better than Boehner, and I might not be able to do as well as Boehner. I think, I think he's in a very difficult situation because when I came along, we had spent from December of 1978 to 1994 building a team to create a majority for the first time in 40 years. We were standing on Reagan's shoulders so we could campaign on welfare reform and everybody knew what the issue was. We were in a position to deal with Clinton and one, once we got through getting his attention by closing the government twice, we were able to actually negotiate pretty effectively. Boehner's in a totally different world. I mean, and I, and I think it's a, it's a world of endurance and it's a world that's, that's probably not nearly as dynamic as, as the one that, that I was engaged in. So I, it's very hard for me to second guess him. I think, he, I think he has a, in some ways he may have the hardest job in Washington. I will say, just to underscore the challenge, Congress in the latest Fox News poll, 17% approve, 77% disapprove in NBC 14. 81, the Republican Party in that same poll, 26%, 49, Democratic Party, 44, 38. Um, so there's a problem here. Houston. No, I, I appreciate 
David, I really appreciate you pointing that out because when Calista and I arrived here tonight, I didn't realize we had a really big problem. And now that I've sat with you, this is this is a good time to be a filmmaker. That's right. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the point the, the young man mentioned, I think, is one that does deserve, because it is part of what's going on but, here. You know, the question was that you raised at the beginning, you thought we were, you thought perhaps going into election day that you were uh, going to win, and a lot of it had to do with the assumptions about the turnout. Right. In 1992, 87% of the electorate was white. Right. In 2012, uh, 72%. Uh, and so, you know, we right. are becoming a much more diverse country. Um, isn't that a big challenge for the Republican Party sure. to find a way to, to relate to this well, look, broader electorate rather than sending yeah, narrowing let, let, let me messages. put this in two contexts. First of all, I ran in 74 during Watergate. By November of 74, 17% of the country identified as Republicans. And we literally were trying to think through whether or not we'd survive. Uh, but this is, this is a, having collapsed from 72. Post when Nixon won, yeah. Nixon won one of the greatest elections in American history. And in two short years, we disintegrated. Yeah, Six there were years. special circumstances. <clears throat> there were, but I'm just saying that we, we had lost enough seats in the House. We were at the lowest point since the Great Depression. Our leadership was totally demoralized. When, when I finally got elected in 78, having also lost in 76 with Jimmy Carter at the head of the ticket in Georgia, um, our leadership was totally exhausted, had no morale, was totally cowed by the Democrats, and, and basically wanted to go off and go home. I mean, it was, it was amazing to be in that kind of environment. So, so the numbers in that sense don't move me. We have 30 Republican governors with 315 electoral votes. We have 24 states in which we have both the governor and the legislature with 51% of the country. So. You know, let, me, let me say, I think this is a place where the Republican Party done a much better job right. than the Democratic so, so the Party. That's right. So the question is, can, I mean, if you look at Springfield in the long run, I kind of like our potential to eventually figure out how to break through, even in this state. So, so when you look at this stuff, my, my point is, it, it's a, it's a half-empty, half-full situation. If everything goes really well for you guys, you might have a surprisingly good 14. If everything goes really bad for you guys, despite the current polling, you might have a surprisingly bad 14. We have no idea today. Well, you know, there was a widely variant turnout in 2010 from right. 2008 and 2012. Right. I think the great challenge is, can we produce a turnout similar right. to this one in and terms of And you might be able to, if you can, it'll be. But the second thing which you raised is exactly right. We have to be able to build on the Susanna Martinez's of the world and the Nikki Haley's and the Bobby Jindal's and, we, and the Tim Scott's. And we have to be able to reach out enough that we reckon, the, the, I mean, a good way to put it is what you just said. We have to campaign in the America that it actually exists, not the America that existed in 1980. Yeah. And until the Republican, or the, minute, the minute the Republican Party, under, so I take 80, the, the minute the Republican Party understands that's the central challenge and everything else is detailed, yeah. then, then you'll, you'll see us begin to solve problems pretty rapidly. I did say during the campaign that, uh, that Governor Romney's problem was that he watches uh, Mad Men and thinks it's the six o'clock news. <laughs> anyway. Hey, I'm Aaron Brogan, a uh, third year in the college, and Speaker Gingrich, I wondered what, what role do you think, or how has Fox News since its inception in the mid-90s, and more recently MSNBC, affected the culture of American politics? Um, I think Fox News was extraordinarily important, as was conservative talk radio in mobilizing the right and solidifying the right. Uh, and I think it was very effective, for example, in the, in the 2010 campaign. I think it had a big impact. I think that um, MSNBC grew as, a, as an alternative uh, for sort of a countervailing focus. And they've had some impact, although not as much as Fox News. Um, but I, I have a hunch that we're about to enter a cycle that's very, very different. We came through starting really with, with, I think, the middle of the Bush years, this tremendous polarization. I mean, the first great polarization is anti-Bush. It's not anti-Obama. And then it's followed by anti-Obama. I think the country is getting, frankly, sick and tired of polarization. And the country may be on the verge of being, and you see this at the governor's races. I mean, the country may be on the verge of saying, you know, we'd, we'd like some people that actually put the country for solve problems and found a way to work with each other. Uh, and if that happens, then both Fox and MSNBC have a challenge because their underlying raison d'etre is fighting. 
Uh, and, and it's going to be more difficult for them to, to deal with a world in which fighting is a secondary value. Hello, my name is Nick Richards. Thanks for being here. Um, I suppose this could be a question for both of you. Um, but in an age where people are, seem to be less politically engaged than maybe other eras in American history, do you ever feel any sense of guilt or regret about the political workings? And perhaps, what is the biggest difference between Newt Gingrich the man and Newt Gingrich the statesman? I think you're going to say Newt Gingrich the man. Do you want me to answer that politician. first? <laughs> <laughs> Well, let me say first, and, and I don't know where David will come down on this, <clears throat> I think this last election was an extraordinary example of turnout. I mean, you guys built a system where, uh, you know, you had 87% turnout in Milwaukee. Now, all of our guys would have told you that was impossible. And it was, it was a great achievement. And I think you've actually done something you didn't do in 09, which, which uh, uh, I'm, I'm very impressed. When I finished Pluff's book, the, the thing I was struck with was, that the, the mechanisms were there early in 09 to continue to sustain engagement, but, but you've done a much better job of sustaining engagement this, this time. And I suspect part of it was just exhaustion of taking over the government in 09. You we had a couple of issues. Yeah, you, 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 you couldn't in quite, you, you could No, I, I had the same experience happen when I took over in 94, that we'd had no Republican in charge for 40 years, and just the exhaustion of trying to figure out how the mechanisms worked. But so I think you're actually moving towards a more engaged future. And I mentioned earlier that, that uh, Gavin Newsom's new book, which I think is really, really helpful on this topic, is, is moving towards this kind of an effort to figure out what's an engaged person. I'll, I'll tell all of you, I, I, helped, I wrote a chapter in a book that Alvin Toffler edited in 19, I think, 75, on what he called anticipatory democracy. And the question was, could you find a way to get people to think about the future and be engaged in a dialogue so it's sort of both participatory and anticipatory? I won't tell you that we have had great success, but it's the same question. I have a hunch you're actually about to see, and you see this with Facebook, for example, you're about to see an explosion of civic engagement because people can organize their networking, not just elect the president, but solving community problems, being engaged in new ideas, following up on a cause you believe in. I think you're likely to see a blossoming of, of per citizen participation in the next generation on a scale that was unthinkable prior to the rise of, of, uh, of wireless mobile communications. Let me say I suspect that some of, the, uh, some of the folks in this audience are going to be a part of that. I, I think this is the most engaged group of young people that I've seen in, in 40 years. And, and one of our goals at the IOP is to suggest that there are ways to uh, exercise that engagement and pursue those goals through the process and not outside of the process. But the young man asked, do we have any regrets? I, the answer to that is yes. I think that we have such refined technology in politics that it's easy for um, lazy candidates to do connect to dot campaigning, pick the top three issues off the list without any authentic uh, any authentic commitment to them and run for office, and some people get elected that way. Uh, and you know, there are other things that uh, that disturb me as well. I still am proud to be living as a, here as an American. I think we have a very vibrant uh, democracy. I think the rest of the world looks at us in that regard. But um, am I happy with everything that has evolved in politics? Uh, no, I think that uh, technology has been a friend in terms of organizing, but also has been destructive in terms of the quality of our politics at times. Hi, thank you, Mr. Axelrod, Mr. Speaker. I'm Yangyang Cheng, PhD candidate in physics. I would like, um, earlier tonight, you mentioned on the issue of immigration, you think the president should take a step back and let the House and the Senate um, work a framework out. On the other hand, we've also seen that on a variety of other issues, including immigration, how members of your party have mentioned how the president should lead. Is there a contradictory message in terms of the opposing party's view on presidential leadership? And does that hinge, is that a legit, legitimate concern or does that hinge on the issue itself? How much potential political capital it would gain or consume? Thank you. Well, and for, for, yes, there is a contradiction. I mean, uh, uh, I, I had this experience I was doing Meet the Press a couple weeks ago 
and Mitch, um, Mitch McDonald was doing us, for some reason he said to all five shows that morning. <clears throat> and his central theme was, <clears throat> we're giving the president this extra revenue and then that's it. He's not gonna get any more. So he does five of these. And in every single one of his appearances he's saying, the president has to show leadership. <clears throat> I'm thinking to myself, I don't want the president to show leadership. I know who President Obama is. He's far more liberal than I am. And, and authentically, if he's gonna lead, he's gonna come up with a whole series of things I don't want. I, n I never once went to Bill Clinton and said, please lead. I went to him and said, please, please compromise. You did once say, please leave. I know, I did say leave. <laughs> he actually, he actually, <laughs> The first year, it's a very awkward thing that you saw Boehner do it recently. The first year we did the State of the Union, Clinton walks in, and you'll notice at the beginning of the State of the Union, the president always hands the vice president, who's there as the head of the Senate, and the speaker, a copy of his speech. He hands me this note and he stares at me, he says, open it up. So I open it up and it says, from William Jefferson Clinton to Speaker Gingrich, I resign. <laughs> and he looks at me and says, oh, that's the wrong one, takes it back. <laughs> and that gives, gives, gives me the thing. But, but let me just say what, what I was trying to say a while ago and may not have said very well. To the degree that the president wants to quietly encourage the Congress and immigration, he may have a positive effect. But the table is set now. People get it. People understand we should do it. There's sort of a general mood of let's try to do it. And I think that to the degree that he gets too heavily engaged early, he probably actually makes it harder because he forces polarization on both sides. Uh, whereas if he lets, th lets them talk in private, lets them sort things out, the legislative process takes time. It's, it's, it's not an overnight kind of thing. And when you try to make it an overnight kind of thing, which you can do if you have massive majorities, which he had uh, in 2009, you can ram things through, but candidly, it's not often the best way to legislate. I mean, there's a, there's a real virtue to having hearings, having markups, having people sort things out, listen to, you know, allowing amendments. Uh, you get dramatically better legislation, and 535 elected officials are smarter collectively than three or four or five elected officials. So, so I, particularly on an issue like this, I think he will get it faster the less he does directly to try to force it. But I think it was a really good question because the answer is yes, there is a paradox. And I think that the way to understand it is that when there are really diff difficult, vexing issues that are f filled with problems, uh, Congress would like the president to go first. And when there's a, a benefit to be had, and on this issue, I think Republicans now recognize there's some political benefit to being part of that solution. Uh, they want to lead. So it's the nature of the great pageant of democracy. Um, let me just say, it has been great fun to have you. Uh, you know, I've always uh, known from a distance that you're one of the most interesting figures out there on the political landscape, and to have time together earlier today with you tonight and for you to spend time with our students has been a great thing for us. So uh, I just want to thank you for being here. Thank you. And The speaker, speaker's been doing a great deal of, uh, of uh, rumination, as he said, about how this whole campaign unfolded, and a lot of focus on the technology of politics, how data was used, how we organized uh, our campaign. Uh, and on Saturday, you'll have a unique opportunity to hear about that. David Pluff is coming here uh, to talk about it and uh, is uh, really a great mastermind behind that strategy. Jeremy Bird and others uh, will be here. So I urge you to come over to Booth in the afternoon on uh, Saturday and uh, spend some time with us. I think it's gonna be a really interesting, uh, a really interesting session. Thank you very much. <laughs>